Good evening and welcome to this lovely uh, Specsavers office here on the south coast um, of England. Um, we're really delighted to welcome you to this Talking Talent in Data with Specsavers conversation this evening. Um, so my name's James and I look after people data here at Specsavers for the UK. Um, it's quite an emerging part of our data strategy, um, but I'm really delighted to be joined by Helen, who's our group uh, global uh, uh, Director of Data, and also Robbie, our Head of Data Enablement as, now, as well. Um, hopefully you can uh, all hear us okay. Uh, please, please do sort of comment and put on your chat um, there if where you're sort of dialing in from today. We'd love to know where you're coming from. Um, hopefully you've got a real mix of people from um, different industries as well. Um, and do give us any questions. So over the course of this evening, we're going to get the opportunity to share with you some of the great stuff that we're doing at Specsavers, um, some of the stuff that we're hoping to achieve, um, but also give you a good sense about what life is like working at Specsavers too. We're going to kick off by handing over to Robbie, who's going to give us a sense a bit about the data strategy here right now. I'd love to. Yeah, thanks, James. Um, for for all the kind of awareness people have about Specsavers and, and our adverts and our brands um, and, our, and our mottos and, and even the amazing customer experience which we have in stores, I'm amazed how frequently I talk to people who, who don't know much around maybe how we operate or some of the data which we have. So um, I promise it's only three brief slides, but as a leveler for our discussion tonight, I just wanted to share a few pieces around um, around some of our data opportunities and how we're set up as a data org. Um, so firstly, if we think about some of our biggest opportunities, um, I don't think um, I don't think these are unique to Specsavers. I think a lot of uh, data professionals will recognise uh, some of these outcomes and some of these opportunities. But just to give you a little bit of a flavour, maybe of where some of our data sets um, and where some of our opportunities are, a little bit unique. Um, really, it starts um, with improving clinical outcomes. Um, the, the, the value every Specsavers employee works to is uh, improving the lives of our customers, uh, and, and more so than a retailer, we very firmly see ourselves as a, as a clinical provider. And of course, we do have a huge amount of patient data uh, and uh, clinical data from from our from our from our brand dominance um, over a period of time. We've got an awful lot of uh, eyesight data, eye test data, um, an awful lot of patient data, and we firmly believe we have the opportunity to improve customers' lives even more through the data uh, in a very ethical way to improve experiences and improve lives. Um, secondary to that, as a lot of organisations are working with right now, um, is around Im improving employee experience and people experience. We, of course, work in, in a partnership fashion, so each of our retail stores is owned by a partner. Um, so, for example, in the UK, we have 29,000 employees. Um, as of last year, we have all of that people data sitting in one place. And, and whilst all of those people aren't directly employed by Specsavers as a group, uh, our care and our consideration for, for people experience extends out to, to all of those people. So um, doing more with our people data is, is key and we'll hopefully hear a little bit more from James around, around our, our strategy and that place to use our people data. Personalization is high on our agenda, um, as is for a number of organizations. Some of that is very much in the digital space as we become increasingly digital as an, as an organization. Um, and some of that is also in, in, in a retail, uh, retail store space as well. How can we personalize? How can we, uh, especially as we become more cross-channel in, in our thinking and in our services, how do we build personalization in? And there's some very exciting projects in, in, in frame selection or in recognition of, of a customer's needs as we diversify. If we're thinking about greater productivity, of course, that can apply to many different business areas, but um, I, I instantly think of our supply chain. A lot of people um, don't realize that we manufacture our frames um, and we are a global organization with, with global logistics to consider. So we've got a huge data set around um, how we manufacture a, a kind of mind blowing combination of lenses and, uh, and prescriptions uh, and frames. Um, so our supply chain is very complex and, and using data to improve that process is, uh, is a big part of our priority as well. And, and through all of these and, and other business domains and other business entities with uh, with exciting data opportunities really comes to improving commercial outcomes, as I'm sure as a lot of other data professionals and data leaders will, will attest, really uh, aligning your, your, your business priorities behind the stuff that's going to give you the biggest value is a, is a big focus for us and we, we believe we can do that. And to talk a little bit around our, our data strategy, just at a just at a very high level, um, it's, it's encapsulated pretty nicely here on this slide. Uh, but these are the three priorities which have been true and consistent for the for the last few years um, since Helen joined um, and kicked off our, our data transformation a few years ago. Um, first is around establishing data culture. I, I can hand on heart say we, we've got a terrific people culture and a, a terrific people employer, and the culture in our data teams is strong. 
but increasingly we're trying to extend that data culture, that data mindset, that data thinking um, across leadership and right across the organization. That flows very nicely into self-service. One of our goals that we try to stay true to is um, everybody at Specsavers has their own data story to tell. Um, and some of that is through mindset, some of it is through technology. Self-service is, is, is at the forefront of all of our thinking. Um, how, how can we democratize our data? How can we use the right combination of technologies to make our, our data reach um, every corner of the organization? Um, and then lastly, it, it's prioritizing very hard. Um, and, and we've been, had a huge amount of success in the last few years by really narrowing in on the right priorities pre-COVID, through COVID, post-COVID. How, how can we prioritize our resources on the right things? Um, be that combining data sources this organization's never combined before to unlock strategic value, to far-reaching uh, BI scorecards, dashboards that thousands of our employees can access right across the organization and right across the globe, uh, through to um, amazing improvements which we've made in, um, in, in, in predictive modeling uh, and uh, and the modeling around those customers' nature. So we've made progress in all of that space, um, but that continues to be at the forefront of our thinking as well. And then finally, just a bit of an overview for those who are, who are curious around how we distribute our resources across the organization. Um, this is a, a, a nice, a concise way of looking at how our teams distribute um, across the organization. As I said, self-service is at the forefront of our thinking, and we really believe we can drive data-driven decisions for the executive here, but also for all Specsavers employees. Um, and that's typically done through these business-aligned teams, analytics teams, BI teams, insight teams. They're distributed across the organization, like a lot of other uh, leading thinkers in the data space. We work with this hub-and-spoke model um, where these teams are aligned into businesses, either into group functions or regionally aligned into the, into the four geographies which we work from as a, as a global business. Um, that's underpinned by, by a global data team um, with a global data strategy and an increasing product focus. We have engineers, we have a big platform focus, we have a growing team of data scientists, enablement, governance, visualization. There's more disciplines there, but uh, really working at the center to, do, to kind of those analytics teams to, to set them up to succeed. Um, and we, of course, rely heavily on our, on our, on our trusted employees in, in technology and legal and, and infosec. So hopefully that's a useful leveler and is a precursor for the um, for the conversation. If anyone on the anyone on the event has got any questions about any of that, then then feel free to jump in with some questions. And, and James is going to moderate. But back over to you, James. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you so much, Robbie. And um, great to see so many people dialing in from different places. So I think we've got Brussels, Newcastle, Galway, Lincolnshire, Sunny Hackney. So um, thank you so much for everyone giving um your your, your time this evening to do that. I know. Probably lots of people want to be in the garden having a nice lolly or something. So um, lovely to see so many people um, joining us tonight. Um, that was really, really useful, Robbie, I think, just to give us that kind of context of, of, of I guess, some of the great work that's that's already kind of started or, or, or well underway. Um, I wondered, Helen, based on the fact that you joined us, I think it was three years ago now, if we could almost kind of rewind right back to your joining experience, actually, and that kind of onboarding experience, because I'm sure, like many people, when you're starting a new business, you get quite excited and fired up for, for, for what to expect. But I just wondered how that transition was and 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 did the organisation that you thought you were joining transpire to be the organisation that you did actually uh, join? Um, yeah, so I mean, um, when I joined, Specsavers was an incredibly immature data organisation. I think we definitely um, moved the needle really on that. Um, but I was at, I was absolutely told that Specsavers was a really lovely place to work. Um, and it absolutely is. Um, it has a really, really lovely family culture. Um, but I think on our data um, transformation journey, we've really started to make a difference. And I really see that within the cultural shift, actually, and mindset shift of, of so many of the different teams around the organisation um, and, and where it is a focus area. Um, where it maybe wasn't wasn't maybe seen as a critical area before, we're really starting to actually change that perception, um, and it's really seen now as a, a really core part of our strategic future, which is really really great to see. No, fantastic, and I think one of the things that a lot of people default to is when they think about data, they jump to the to to, to, to actually the output, don't they? As opposed to almost once you've got that output, what do you do with it? What's the data literacy sort of skills that you need? And I just wondered what's been your sort of approach to kind of tackle that, I guess, to try and improve that maybe at a leadership level and then in different roles across the organisation? Yeah, I mean, it's still very much sort of work in progress, but there's so many um, different ways that we're trying to tackle that. Um, yeah. Huge amount of different um, training opportunities around the organisation, which we're, we're continually trying to add 
more and more things into that um, process. Um, but but also we're we're a big believer, I suppose, as a team in that we want people to come and talk to us as a team um, and and really discuss and and throw around ideas. Um, and I think it's it's that um, it's the combination of actually the people in the business who really understand their areas, plus some data experts like Robbie and like so many others in in the central team and and you know like in, in the in this region teams in your teams James as well. And it's the combination of those sort of debates I think that lead us to a much better um, position and allow us to really drive um, you know really great projects with really clear outcomes. Um, and it, it, and I think that that's why we've been able to actually change the, the see that cultural shift actually, um, and that change to actually um, people feeling like actually it's it data is part of our strategic future because we've started to showcase some of the benefits that data can really drive, um, and it's and it's it's little by little, but we're slowly seeing that tick up and move across the organisation, and it, it's an exciting it's an exciting journey. Um, it's really, it's really exciting to see that shift. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, one of the things that I, I picked up on, Robbie, when you were sort of doing your introduction is you mentioned data ethics, and that feels like a really topical, both within the industry, but also conversations I think we're having around around spec savers. And when we are um, ultimately a healthcare provider, so we do have that kind of clinical volume of data, as well as obviously information about our people. How how, how are you kind of wrestling with that as a team in terms of how we use that in a, in, in a way that ensures we're compliant to all of those different bits of legislation, but also we can still get the leverage of using that to, to, to hopefully kind of improve the customer experience as an example? Yeah, I think there's this, this conventional and, and typical ways to, to, to tackle that, which we're looking at from a legal standpoint around around right to capture. And I think that applies to our, our clinical data. And as you all know very well, around the ethics of our people data and, and other data sets as well, and, and what's our privacy policy and what's the right thing to do from a, from a legal standpoint. Um, and then the other very interesting thing, which we're acutely aware of, um, Heather, our, our head of data science, is um, a huge, uh, huge fan in this space, is, is what, what is bias in, in data ethics as well which is which is something like people like to think of within within our modeling um but that, that's the other kind of the other side of data ethics as well um I, I think it's a topic which is emerging i think we've got some very forward thinking um in in the people data space and i think we've got some very forward thinking in our um in our predictive modeling and and in our customer segmentation um but as, as we begin to use data more broadly, and that is a big part of our data strategy, is to go broader and enable more business areas. I think data ethics is something which isn't exclusive to customers or patients. It's, it's something that applies right across the board. And I think we'll tackle it as we as we realise more value in those business areas. Yeah, I think it's really true, isn't it? Because actually what we want is we want everybody in the organisation to care about data ethics in the same way that we want them to start to own their data. Um, so it's it, although you know, we, we might um, start to hope lead that from a central team. We, we want everybody to be involved. And when we talk about devolving, it's not just devolving analytics, it's devolving ownership, it's devolving, you know, um, responsibilities and ethics around care of data as well the whole package really. And I was going to ask you a little bit about that actually Helen. So in terms of the sort of structure I guess that you've put in place over the sort of time that you've been here, we do have a sort of dedicated and centralised kind of team but you've also talked about this kind of approach of devolving some of that responsibility. How how do those two kind of elements come together? Because I imagine there's sometimes there's conflict and sometimes there's you know bits where that really really works really well. How, how do you wrestle yeah. with that? I mean it's tricky isn't it? I <laughs> yeah. think uh, you've always got you know people that are really advocates and then people that are um, you know comfortable doing what they're doing already um, but I think that um, I probably one of the probably one of the things I've learned over the last couple of years is that it, it's it's sometimes easier to start with with your advocates um, and I think we've we've built actually an awful lot of traction from starting with people who really want to come with us and 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 actually what we found is that some of the people who are a bit nervous about um, uh, sort of joining us on our journey have actually come back round and 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 a later date sort of said, um, you know, we 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 want to get involved. Um, and and I think sometimes you can if you if you push people too much, it, it kind of almost switches them off. Um, so we're very much a, and I think we we're quite quite lucky in some ways because um, when I joined, we were a very immature organisation, but we also had a lot of people in the organisation that were quite frustrated that they couldn't do a lot with data. Yeah. So um, as we started to open up and provide the capability for people to do more with data, we actually had already quite a lot of people who were quite excited by that and, and wanting to and wanted to progress. And um, it, it's given us actually a good um, 
uh, I suppose, foundation of, of, of community um, that can really start to create that ripple effect across the organisation. And that's really what we're looking to do. No, lovely. Thank I, th you. I think, Saran, again, we're, we're talking about talent in this conversation, but I think we've done a terrific job um, striking the right balance of kind of like external talent and, and extremely enthusiastic mobilisation of, of Specsavers resources who've got the aptitude for some of this data stuff as well. That's something I kind of come back to quite a lot when we're talking to new business areas setting up these capabilities is striking that right balance. I think if we just went all external on our recruitment, A, I think we would have been recruiting for the last three years flat out. <laughs> Feels like we have been, but, but maybe not as much as we would have been um, because, because we've, we've mobilised quite a lot of internal resources. Um, but I don't think you can do it all internally because you do need the best practice. You do need people who've been there, other organisations who know what best practice looks like. And I think most of our teams have a really good combination of that um, deep spec savers knowledge with, um, you, know, we, you know, we've got quite a lot of legacy platforms. We've got quite a lot of processes right that process and systems knowledge is is very very important combine that with the with the external knowledge is 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 the key really i'd say and, and just focusing on that from a skills perspective then so again just to kind of almost fast forward to, to be able to help us kind of look forward um just, just going back to um your, your first kind of observations what were the skill gaps that you kind of see could see in the in the organization and yeah. how have you kind of gone about kind of plugging some of those yeah i mean i think um i mean I was I was quite surprised actually when I first joined that we didn't we didn't have a reporting tool, um, so we were sort of a hundred percent Excel, um, which I found quite surprising. Or um, and, and I suppose where we were using maybe reporting tools, it was um, it, it was very manual, um, nothing nothing sort of automated. Um, uh, and I think we've 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 obviously massively shifted now. Um, but I think it's 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 an evolution and it's an ongoing process. And I'm absolutely not going to pretend that we're anywhere near where I'd like to see us in the future. Um, there's so much there's so much more um, upskilling that I think we have to do across the organisation. But I think um, uh, we've made really great progress so far, uh, and I think there's quite a lot of excitement about what that journey looks like and, and the capability that's uh, that's there. And I think the more people we can get excited across the organisation, um, you know, it, it's, say, I'm sure you see this, James, too, um, but um, the more hopefully then those people can also enthuse um, and get other people excited about what's possible in their own um, areas of the business. And that's what we're really looking for. And I think we've done quite a good job at tapping into um, you know, lots of different groups around the organisation. Um, so we've got quite a good wide spread, but it's 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 small pockets, I would say, at the moment. Whereas obviously in the future we want it to be um, much much broader spread yeah. of people that have that have um, I suppose uplifted cap data capabilities. Yeah, and and I'm making decisions based on data. We all sort of naturally kind of make informed decisions throughout our lives outside of work in in work but but actually it's it's there is a different skill set required isn't there sometimes when you're presented with data maybe in a slightly more visual way or in a different way to help to help inform it i, I know certainly from a uh, hr and, and and people perspective we're starting to present our data in a way that means that we're identifying trends or themes that we've maybe overlooked or never considered before because we've now got our data in one place and we can we can use it. And already that's really, really exciting. But then it creates a new challenge, which is how do we then bring that kind of collective sort of HR leadership team into a place where they can almost digest that information and uh, and use that to drive us forward? So it's such a good point, isn't it? Because we think when we talk about upskilling, it's so often I think people think automatically well, it's Power BI training or it's technical <laughs> training, but it so isn't, is it? It's yeah. it's 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 training at all levels of the organisation um, from very senior um, board members, le senior leaderships, all the way through to people in our stores. Yeah. Um, and it needs to be end to end across the organisation. And that's that is what we're looking to do. And like I say, we've still got a, a, we've still got a lot of work to do, but we're, we're definitely, um, I think, making good progress. Yeah, definitely. And it's, it's been great to see some of that and just observe it from afar. And now, and now, like I say, it's quite emerging for our people, people data experience. But we're really starting to kind of bring that to life here as well. So it's quite it's quite an exciting time. Um, I, I just wonder in terms of 
we are naturally a quite a complex organization because there's quite a few component parts. We've got a, a huge manufacturing and distribution network that, that, that spans globally across lots of different countries. And um, as you mentioned, Robbie, products flying from production lines around to, to, to obviously all of our stores. Um, we've, we've got a network of support offices and then we've got this quite complex kind of partnership model, which, which has kind of this joint ownership of, of potentially data, but also, uh, you know, custodians of, of colleague um, experience or, or the experience of our customers. How did you know where to start? Where was the kind of the approach of actually, if I go to manufacturing distribution, that's going to make the biggest difference right now, or actually it's the colleague bit. Where, where was in your kind of head at that point? It was a trait. I think when I, when I first um, started, the strategy was um, to almost try and find a, a really good um, project with a with a with significant value um, in each of the sort of main areas of the organisation. So sort of one from supply chain, one clinical use case, one um, uh, finance, marketing, etc. Um, I think though actually what happened was we had um, maybe more stakeholders in certain areas of the business that were far more passionate and, and far more eager to start to um, really um, get at their data and do more with it. Um, and therefore, um, and obviously limited resources. Uh, and so we we have sort of been slightly skewed, I would say, and, and focused a little bit more in, in some areas of the business than others, but we're definitely trying to even that out a little bit now. Um, and I think it's really great that, um, I mean, we, we're probably focused initially more on, on marketing and clinical, but I think that um, it's great actually that clinical took a focus. It was such an important part of our business and I think that was a really good decision. Um, you know, we're so focused around delivering better outcomes for our, for our customers and it's really nice to have seen some of those outcomes. It feels really, you know, um, fulfilling as, as a role to do those sorts of things as well. So I think uh, really great for the team and, and, and really great for the organisation as well. I think that's helped us get traction actually more widely. Yeah, I, I think there's a really lovely thread, isn't there, that kind of that runs right the way from the data strategy right up to our, our almost our company kind of mission and purpose, which is to improve the lives of our customers through through great sort of sight and and and, and, and hearing support. And and that is so driven by data, isn't it, and the work that you guys have done. And hopefully now we're again with that kind of focus of, of people data, we can almost in parallel do the same through our people actually and improve the the, the, the colleague experience that our, our colleagues have that then means that they can help more customers and, and they can go on and do that. So it's, it's I think it's sometimes very easy when you've got that, that, that link between the kind of corporate strategy to your own, isn't it, to be able to, to really kind of bring that to life, which is which is great. Um, we've got a question actually from um, um, Andy, who's just sort of said, what's been your biggest sort of uh, data challenges um, that you've had? Is it technical challenges, is it stakeholder buy-in, maybe sort of colleagues' willingness to, to, to adapt or, or adopt new data services and reporting? What's what, what, what things have kind of been the, 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 the blockers or the things that you've had to navigate the most? I think um, there's probably a couple for me, but um, probably, probably one one of the key ones, which is probably front of mind at the moment, is um, because we've been on, on quite a significant data transformation programme over the last three years, we started with a very, very small team. Um, so initially when I joined, we were only a team of five. Um, and um, and that growth trajectory has been quite significant. So um, the, the process of bringing people in, recruiting them, um, you know, um, uh, making sure that everybody knows, has a good understanding of Specsavers and what we're trying to do, um, uh, or upskilling people who've maybe come in with Specsavers knowledge, but in data, but still delivering at a good pace yeah. and still keeping up with what is an ever increasing demand. And, the, you know, it's great because we've, we've, we've made great progress, but um, on the flip side, when you make great progress, your demand uh, massively increases. Your success, <laughs> yeah, you? yeah, yes. yeah, you do. Your demand massively increases, and then you've still got to try and recruit more people, keep demand, still training, and it's so it's an ever you kind of always on that hamster wheel. And I think that is a bit of a challenge. I'd say the the, the second one is is definitely around probably data quality. Yeah. Um, I think from an immature organisation, we just um, you know we, we are trying to devolve that responsibility, as I said, around you know all the different aspects of data. Um, but but it's but it's slow and it takes time, um, you know. And I think it's um, yeah, it's difficult and and undoubtedly, um, you know, influencing data is all you know, it's hearts and minds. Um, so you know, trying to you know, getting everybody on board, um, you know, to actually driving through, you know, with the strategy is is also a little bit of a challenge. But I think with all these things, there are opportunities as well, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think we've gone through, like many organisations, I'm sure, I'm sure we, our growth has happened in the 90s and, and, and the early sort of 2000s. And that means that a lot of system infrastructure is plugged in then. But the world has moved on so much, hasn't it, in terms of actually what, what you need now and the cloud versus servers and all of this kind of stuff. So actually unpicking some of that and plugging in new bits that connect and integrate and, and work together is, is naturally going to be kind of quite a, a long programme of activity, isn't it, to kind of make that happen. Is that slowing you down or, or are you kind of finding ways to get around that and, and still kind of deliver what you need to deliver? Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's, I would say that technology isn't the biggest barrier in all honesty. I don't know, do you agree, Robbie? No, yeah, yeah. you're definitely cool. Yeah, um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I personally don't think it's the biggest barrier. Undoubtedly, there are more things that we could probably add to our technology stack that would help us. But equally, I think that well, God, technology is never the golden bullet, no. um, even, even if it sort of pretends to be. But but it also, it takes an awful lot of time to embed technology. So even when you bring it in, it sort of, it does sort of slow you down before it speeds you up, I think, is, is sort of my view. But yeah, and, and I'd kind of add to that conundrum of, like you say, some 90s infrastructure growth of the business in that region, um, in that era, sorry. The business hasn't stopped growing since then, right? It's, it's still highly successful, highly successful with high like colleague motivation, high colleague engagement. So when you've got an organisation that feels so good to work for with such strong leadership that's so financially successful, you know, how, how do you then unpick some of that and say this fundamentally needs addressing? Because perhaps other organisations or other industries really need to take an insular look at how can we change things up? Whereas when, when we continue to make the progress which we do, addressing data quality or outdated infrastructure or outdated uh, platforms is um, is something which you then have to make that much more of a justification for when, it, when it's coming from a backdrop of success. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, you're right. I think we see it in lots of areas, actually, probably not just data, but it's it's that analogy, isn't it, of, of changing the tire while the car's still moving. It's, it's, it's everything's still there. You're still running with everything you need to do whilst trying to, in, in some cases, actually do quite a lot of infrastructure change to, to, to get us into a place where actually we're, we're fit for the future and we can continue to, 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 to evolve. Um, obviously, it's been really exciting in Specs over the last couple of years because actually at a time where some organisations, unfortunately, have had to sort of slow up in terms of their growth, we've actually had the opportunity to, to enter a new market. So we've got um, Canada and, and our, um, I think it was 2,500 stores that um, opened this week, which is really, really exciting and, and, and echoes that kind of growth sentiment that you said. Um, how's your kind of view sort of shaping up, Helen, in terms of that kind of global opportunity versus there's some great stuff that's already happening in the UK, but are you also got kind of an up and out view of, of, of where the opportunities are there as well? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, we're obviously a global team and, um, we definitely want to um, expand, you know, a, across all our regions. We are a little bit EMEA focused today um, um, than wider, but um, we're, 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 we're making steps to try and resolve some of those, some of those sort of just wider complexity, um, sort of regulatory issues as well. But um, I, we will definitely unpick that. It's just a matter of um, when I suppose rather than um, or you know it, it, when it happens and it, it will definitely come um, but I think uh, it's 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 not always as simple as it sounds unfortunately. Yeah no, especially in a very strong people culture like this where there's uh, such empowerment in people um, and it's, it's the right balance right data and analytics isn't uh, isn't it's, it's a team sport right yeah, yeah and we've got the right technologies in modern day data and analytics to enable lots of people to do lots of really good stuff so we don't want to hold down emerging regions or, or, or slow down any of that growth, but it's it's a it's a what point do you uh, do you apply some global consistency, maybe in how you work, maybe the, the tools that you use. Striking the right balance of, uh, of rigor versus empowerment is is one of the things I was going to point to earlier when you talked about challenges. That, 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 that the balance between the two, especially in today's age, is um, quite interesting. Uh, and the dynamic of the organisation, I don't know about you two, but I remember when I joined sort of five, six years ago, is 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 it's very unique in that you we're still a family led organisation, but we're global and massive in terms of the component parts that are there. And you, you've kind of got this um, stuff where you're dealing with patients, but also customers and that language bit is a bit of a nuance that you kind of have to when you go and visit a store, get your head around and uh, and stuff. Um, it, it feels quite unique in terms of that culture. How how have you experienced that coming in, both of you being relatively new? Is, 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 are there kind of pros and cons to that or is there some sort of challenges that come from from, from that uniqueness? Yeah, um, a great question. I, I'm continually um, and like legitimately blown away how, how very much it is focused around um, 
around our clinical outcomes, you know, it's like it's one thing to say it and it's another thing to then stay true to it. And Specsavers consistently says we want to improve the lives of our customers and we want to be a great place to work and, and then consistently does those things like day in, day out at leadership levels in, in finance or, or people or or in, in that clinical space or in the retail space um, or in supply chain. It, it's um, it's really remarkable to see, actually. Um, and it, it, it did take me a while to um, you know, really come around to an organization that does have that really narrowed in focus um, and p uh, potentially at times not even uh, not even a huge commercial focus you know a commercial focus at the detriment of being so heavily focused on um, on doing the right thing by our, by our customers and the organization's got a long history of um, you know of doing that and that's why as, as Helen said it's so terrific that we've had the opportunity to uh, really knock it out of the park with some data projects in that clinical space. Um, and there's a number of examples of really good stuff we've been able to do. And there's a lot more to go after, given the the kind of uh, the, the granularity of data we've got in that clinical space. And I, I was going to just sort of touch on customers as well. So we talked about that kind of clinical sort of element. So there's lots of kind of data sitting there and obviously trying to improve that kind of experience. But but actually, from a customer kind of satisfaction point of view, there is so much data. I think it's uh, 40 million customers that kind of um, shop with us a year, which is which is incredible. And and that, that is a real richness that comes from that. Coming back to how the organisation is structured and 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 kicked off and started by the Perkins family. I know Dame Mary is still so passionate about customer service and still mystery shops and. and and engages with those kind of teams how what sort of responsibility do you feel in terms of kind of using that data then to continue to kind of drive a better experience from those people that that kind of choose to visit us on the high street i i think it's it, it's a really cool it's a really cool part isn't it i think clinical outcomes customer experience and employee experience have to be pretty much the top three things that i think we've we're focused on and 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 data you know ultimately is always an underpinner it, it underpins your business outcomes and that's how it drives the, the value and because we've got such a core focus on that and um you know it, it's um it, it undoubtedly data will absolutely um drive huge huge benefits um in those areas and it's it's really lovely actually to work in a company that is so focused in those areas um and it feels very rewarding and, and it's um yeah it, it's really lovely and actually i think because there is such a um culture around that um you just naturally the use cases that you come across in the organization are just naturally all geared towards those things um which is really great yeah and it still feels quite personal doesn't it so as much as we yeah. do lots of, kind of really whizzy things in terms of presenting data and making it grass and, and and interacting it in great ways there's also just that really kind of beautiful thing of just having a, a customer comment that you can pass on to a colleague to say oh and that's what the customer said about you and it's that kind of blend of the two that is is is, is really powerful actually isn't it sometimes i think it makes a real difference to the to the colleague Definitely. as well receiving that i mean it's so true i mean it's a really interesting one, isn't it? Because one of our, I think, which um, I think Robbie mentioned this slightly earlier, but one of our core goals is around um, data stories. And it's exactly that, that story with a little bit of data, ultimately. And the, the combination of those two becomes really, really powerful. Um, and it really it really allows people in the organisation to, uh, to articulate, actually, um, the things that they're doing with big data, but they're, you know, they're also articulating it in a much broader way um, with the real value add that they're bringing. And I think um, what we're hoping with sort of this goal is ultimately that it will start to encourage more and more people to tell tell stories with data. And it, I agree with you, it's a combination of the two that becomes really powerful. Yeah, yeah. Um, I had a great question here from Tom as well, actually, just about um, governance. So um, he just said, um, how do you balance the threats of processing data with the opportunities that um, Robbie touched on earlier? So is there a specific um, or relevant kind of board that defines risks and appetites for that? Um, or, or actually, is it kind of um, uh, sort of amended kind of as you go and you just kind of take quite an iterative kind of approach to it? So I don't know who wants to grab that, but yeah, piece around governance, I think. Yeah, happy to speak to it. I'd, I'd say governance is a very multifaceted thing, right? Uh, but it sounds like more we're, we're talking about kind of use of data there, processing of data. Uh, and we tackle that very much at a domain level. Um, as I said earlier, we, we've got varying maturity of, um, of data capabilities. Uh, but where we do have high maturity, uh, particularly in the customer space, it, it's, it's managed there at a, a domain level. Um, with heavy legal involvement at the right level uh, and then our, our marketing leadership team making sure we're doing the right thing with that data. Um, it's, it's a great question. Like I say, get, 
other, other areas of governance. Um, I think we can apply more uh, central con control around and we're beginning to think about some of those things around data ownership and data stewardship um, and data ethics, as we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, but around that a kind of appropriate capture and appropriate use of data, very much managed at a, at a domain level. And I think more of those teams like we were talking about with ethics earlier, more of those boards, more of those conversations will, will need to happen as we begin to develop maturity in, in our supply chain capabilities. I know you're thinking about it. You can probably answer, like, what are we doing with governance around people data, employee yeah, data, what I, are we doing? I, I, we're I just think, setting that up, right? Abs absolutely. I think it's a really topical one in terms of um, sort of people data because we're in this very sort of strange paradox in that we, so for example, diversity and inclusion is a massive sort of topical kind of part of every organisation at the moment. Um, and absolutely, we want to sort of track our progress and and, and, and make sure that we're, um, we're continuing to make spec savers and even more inclusive place to work. But there's a balance around actually what we do data capture and actually how we use it and the transparency about that. And it's 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 that kind of paradox that you're constantly kind of trying to, 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 to kind of work with, aren't you, to make sure that actually we, we, we take the best of it, but we aggregate it to a level that doesn't mean it's identifiable and actually that we're just using it to pick out those trends and those themes or highlight areas of risk or hotspots where actually we might want to do a bit more kind of work to, to, to kind of work on. So, yeah, I think it's it's it's, and we and again we've got a kind of people 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 kind of data kind of governance group that, that that I know you know we've got membership from from across your teams and and our um, information security teams and GDPR and all of those kind of relevant bodies to make sure that we we do keep an eye on it because it's too easy I think sometimes to just sort of go off into a little bit of a tangent and 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 kind of make sure that you you pull it back. Um, the other challenge, and I guess it's continuous kind of piece, is this global organisation. We know that legislation is different in each organisation. We have now in the UK, obviously, you know, part of Brexit, are kind of working through actually what's, you know, how how's GDPR going to continue to to work alongside this. So it's um, yeah, it's 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 an ever moving kind of challenge, I think, and I'm sure that's probably reflective to to to, to everyone that's kind of working in those industries as um uh, as well. Um, I just wondered if we could kind of focus about kind of skills as well, because I know a couple of people have asked just around kind of skills that we kind of recruit for. So it'd be great to get a sense of, I guess, I know we talked a little bit about tools. So what technical kind of tools that we're using and 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 then almost kind of what the sort of skills are that we normally kind of recruit for. If we talk about a, um, a kind of data visualizer, what, what do you expect? What's your kind of connotations of that? Um, it would be great to get a sense of that, please. Yeah, happy to give a high level overview on tech and then let's quickly move into skills, because I think the tech in data is one thing. Um, but the, the skills are, I think, are more important, and we see that echoed quite a lot. But yeah, we um, we run a Azure platform, pretty much a single cloud organization um, in Azure, be that where we host our applications or, or where we host our data lake. Um, we're running with a um, we're running with a data lake with a pretty modern uh, lake house architecture on top, utilizing Databricks, which is a very popular technology across Specsavers. We've used it to its kind of full strength to really put. Um, to really kind of democratize access of data, democratize modeling of data, joining of data, transformation of data right across the organization and put data bricks in the hands of not just our data engineers, but a number of data analysts across the organization. And then on top of Databricks, um, we have a handful of um, analytics tools. We've got really good versatility in our data lake that we can connect other tools to it. But the primary tool of choice, um, which most of our teams use for, for BI and visualization is, is Power BI. And then the team, the tools are our data scientists are uh, running with uh, are all in the user stack with uh, with ML Factory, and our, our engineers are using uh, Data Factory as well in in that um, in that space. So without getting too much into technology, that's the flavour of technologies yeah, which yeah. we have, um, and, and we've got an eye on emerging things. Nothing particularly stands still in this space. A very aggressive vendor space in terms of realising good value, and we'll continue to keep an eye on it. Um, so th that's the tools, and then and I think if we're talking about skills. Well, we're recruiting right now for you know a breadth of roles. We're, we're recruiting at the centre for data roles. We're recruiting across most of our geographies for data analyst roles. Um, Visualisation and, and data analysts are uh, um, uh, at the forefront. We are recruiting data scientists. We're recruiting um, agile experts. We're recruiting data engineers. We're recruiting data governance people. Um, we are um, you know we, we are growing very much as as uh, as our data maturity grows and all those skills are pretty key um I'd, I'd probably point to if we look at where we are in, in most of our business areas i think we'll see um, a, a large growth in um, in visualization and data analyst capabilities as we begin to evolve more and business more business areas do more with data um, but i don't think we'll really um, slow down on recruiting data scientists or data engineers anytime soon either you know 
Yeah, and we talk about talent pooling, don't we? And and, and that kind of constant kind of pipeline of, of talent. So um, it's really important that that's kind of kept quite live. And, and and we're always interested to kind of chat and engage with people that have got those skills and a real appetite to make a difference in in an organisation like um, Specsavers as well. So um, yeah, if uh, we'll do a quick plug of the the careers website, but please do um, check out all of our kind of live vacancies if that's stuff that um, is of interest to you and you're you're liking hopefully what you've um, you're kind of hearing um, hearing about tonight. Um, I just wondered in terms of just the marketplace as well so so sort of thinking about kind of roles and and, and and skills we hear loads at the moment around the sort of great resignation and that's really kind of you know a kind of statement and headline that's kind of thrown around are we experiencing that as spec savers are you seeing lots of movement and change or or actually is it coming is our opportunities coming from growth i think um we, we're not um actually and i think um it's probably a couple of reasons for that um, the first is that we've got a really great team and, and Spexiv is such a lovely culture. I think people enjoy working here and people work, enjoy working in the team. So although, you know, we know it's, it's, it's a common trend, um, but, but actually over 90 percent of our of our team um, uh, stay year on year, um, you know, which is really great to see. And um, uh, and, and, and we, we've got a really exciting data journey. Um, and, and we're constantly wanting to develop, you know, I think um, we're wanting obviously to upskill the entire organisation. Um, so training and development is really important for us. Um, but I think as well at the centre, it's even more important um, because we recognise that as a central team, we want to keep pushing and keep expanding and, and, and keep staying sort of more cutting edge. And the only way we can really do that is to keep training and developing. Um, and I think because of because of a combination of those things, you know, the 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 really lovely culture that Specsavers has, um, you know, the, the great working friendliness and, and support within the team, um, but also the sort of the development opportunities, um, partly driven by the fact that we're transforming and we're growing and, um, and we're, we're constantly wanting to improve. I think it's, it's a combination why people actually really want to stay. Um, and we also see, I think, a lot within, so it sort of leads to another reason, but we also see a lot of people applying for roles either within our team from from wider spec savers um, teams um, or even within our team looking for promotions. Um, so we find that I think last year 40% of our vacancies were either internal or internal promotions within our team, which is actually like quite you know like it's incredible actually, isn't it? Um, but it, but it's really great actually because it means that we've got an awful lot of spec savers knowledge, and I think. Um, you know, that, that I think that's partly what makes our team actually quite successful in the last couple of years is that spec savers knowledge. I think, Robbie, you spoke about this earlier, um, plus the data expertise. And it's the two together that I think really allows us to to really make progress and inroads in the organisation. And, and that's what we're really looking for, I think. Brilliant. And, and someone just mentioned around the kind of interview and kind of selection process. So if they were interested in a role, what could they expect to kind of experience from a candidate perspective? We, I think we're trying to align on align on our recruitment processes and even on our talent search as well initiatives like this um the talent pools which we're running um so we recognize maybe not everyone is aware of exactly what data discipline they want to be in for example um so we are running open talent processes um and, we're, and the one thing i'd say we're, we're trying to move as much pace as possible we, you know we we recognize um especially in this day and age the expectation and the candidate experience which they're looking for um is to move a pace we've got the agility so um got the, the approval and the authority to do so um, so that, that's the one thing we try and do um, we're not focusing too hard on 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 much kind of like technical testing and um, of course uh, for the more technical roles we have across our teams we we, we want to push on technical tests but you know a, a, a test or a presentation you know potentially can slow down the process and put, put a lot of ask on a candidate I think we can ask the right questions through technical probing in our interviews to to, to gauge people's uh, background and their technical aptitude um, so it's that we're pretty much running running at three stages like you'd expect, but but three swift stages um, across all of our roles and and and, and looking to move quite quickly. Yeah, and I think it's it, but probably with my um, HR hat on now as well is is we really align that process to to our kind of core sort of behaviours and, and values that we see across the organisation. So that whilst the technical elements of, of that process will obviously be aligned to a specific role, um, actually the, the 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 value element of it will 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 be the same for any role that that, that comes up in spec savers. And and that's really important because I think that really sits to to, to, to the kind of core values of the organisation that we see right from our leadership team right the way through the organisation as well. So hopefully that feels fair fairly consistent, I think, for any any role that you kind of come through um, as well. And I, I'd probably add as well, and, and um, 
and Helen will definitely attest to this because Helen likes to meet a lot of almost every candidate, which you know, which we want to offer to. It's a massive. <laughs> it's frustration. <laughs> <laughs> um, I say in, the, in, in jest, but it's true. There's a, there's a massive cultural focus on a uh, cultural fit on on everything we're bringing in, and, and sometimes that term is thrown around like cultural fit. Like, like, what does it actually mean? But you know, we really are trying to make sure. We've got a terrific organisation. We've got a terrific culture. We've got amazing purpose as a data team. We want to make sure we've got we're bringing the right people into that. Um, and yeah. We don't mean that in like a an exclusive like you need to fit our gang, but um, a cultural fit into our team is um, you know is, is a big thing. Like is specs, are you going to get the enjoyment and thrive from spec savers? Are you going to be motivated? Are you going to help drive the business outcomes which we want? Um, so we, we are we are putting a massive focus on that as well. I think it's fair to say that. Uh, most people see quite a movement, don't they, in, in their time with spec savers. I think the opportunities are there and whether they're linear and, and sideways steps, whether they're upward steps, there's, there's just so many options, aren't there? I think the, the the model that we've got, certainly from a data perspective of having this, this core centre of expertise, but also these kind of this community that's being sort of emerging in different parts of the organisation just creates that opportunity for movement, doesn't it? To go, actually, I'm, I work in that central team, but I'll go and do a stint in the clinical bit or I'll yeah, go and yes. do some bits of marketing yes. now. So yeah. even yeah. to be able to flex your your muscles in a different data set or a different part of the organization i think it's really exciting actually to see the opportunities there isn't it yeah i yeah i think absolutely right i think yeah there's this huge amount of opportunities and i, I do think spec savers is really good actually at allowing people to move um across roles or or supporting them actually transition into new roles and it's something that um yeah i think i've noticed more broadly but i think we definitely see as well within the team um but yeah, I, I, I completely agree. I think it is exciting. And and, and thinking about uh, just sort of coming back to, I guess, kind of where we want to kind of get to, we talk, or you mentioned a lot around that kind of immaturity of data when you first sort of joined and, and obviously loads of work's been done. And we saw that at the, at the start of the session. How do you also keep that kind of eye on just what else is going on in the in in that kind of wider industry? Did, did you feel like you've got that connection and we're also hopefully leapfrogging actually probably some of the positions where we've come from to actually now be in a place where actually we can kind of look back and say well we've just skipped that step because we're yeah. now here I mean it's 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 really true isn't it I think that uh, undoubtedly I mean qu quite a lot of people um you know often assume that you've kind of got to walk before you can run um but but I actually think within data you know the reality is that once you've got the data platform you've got the data in you can open the doors to what you do with it. Um, and I think that this is where you can you can start to do some really quite cool advanced stuff as well as your basic reporting almost simultaneously yeah. if you've got the appetite and the resource to do it. And um, and I think um, you know, therefore we are we are already starting to to do more and more advanced things and undoubtedly that will continue to grow. And I think we've got some really exciting stuff, I think, um, in the future. And I think it's um it, it, there's just so many opportunities with the vast array of data sources um, and different areas um, that that it's is it is is a really exciting journey I think um, and it is I mean it's fascinating to think where we could end up really yeah 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 and I think that's the excitement bit isn't it that's the kind of get you out of bed every day kind of sort of mentality isn't it of we just don't quite know actually where where it is. We know a direction of travel, but we don't. Yes. We've we've never got that end goal. Almost, it's it's always moving. It's always kind of um, sort of going on to the yeah, next thing, which absolutely. feels feels quite exciting, doesn't it? Yeah. The, the one area you're definitely leapfrogging in is. Is, is, is willingness for data sharing across the organization and willingness to put data into a data platform. Yeah. There'll be lots of people listening to this who, who are maybe having conversations right now with business stakeholders saying, we need to get the data out of this platform to, do, to join it with other ones, because otherwise the ceiling is so low. And, and James, this is conversations we've had. Yeah. Yes, is out of the box reporting available within our people platform. Yes, some of that is key for operational stuff for, for fast reporting. But if we're really going to make a difference to that, we need to join it with other people data sources. And, and uh, doing that in an application isn't the place to do it yeah. and i think there's a broad uh, uh kind of like acceptance right across the organization that our data platform um is, is a place to be there's, we're not in contention with other data platforms we don't have a legacy data platform we don't have areas of the organization who don't want to put data there so that's the that's the one thing i think we are leapfrogging for and and, and something we don't really have any resistance in which is which is great yeah and and from a people perspective i think it, i guess my approach to some of this is 
if if you want to report self serve it we'll we'll build it for you we'll get it to a place where you can just do it because my team can't add value in that long term we'll just get it so you can you can self serve it i'd much rather they put the focus on like you say that kind of the, that analytics stuff and some of the some of the bits that i'm really excited about is how we start combining our people data with with potentially our our, our kind of sales information or our customer satisfaction information to be able to piece that together to tell stories about actually what's happening in in store in in in, in essex for example if we wanted to and just get that kind of full picture of how our colleagues are feeling how they're passing on hopefully a great experience to their customers and, and actually that what difference that's going to make in terms of um, how profitable that organi- uh, business is so I think it's it's the leverage of having those things together it's just really really exciting and we're not quite there yet but 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 I can see it and it's it's definitely a place to kind of head to which is um yeah which is really cool um somebody, somebody just asked uh, will, will our drive towards a more sort of data-led um, um, business lead um mm-hmm. will change our kind of recruitment strategy so do, do, do we sort of expect what you described as our kind of recruitment approach we're going to differ because we're going to need more or because we're going to different places what, what was your thoughts on that so what in, in, in i don't know do you get a sense of what the question is on on skills or our approach or, or, or our search I think just, or? just in terms of the the, the, the um the, the recruitment strategy so yeah so i i would include that i would include things like scope skills um selection process all of that kind of stuff do you see that kind of evolving or changing or what do you think we've got it right and and actually it's just about probably more volume that we need to put through that kind of um that engine if you like um i I think I think going broad in, in initiatives like this, I think clearly cast the light of the way trying to do our best to kind of portray how brilliant our data team is and, and our analytics teams are and the opportunities which are available. So I think this is an example of us evolving our approach um, and, and and owning that space, so to speak. Um, so yeah, I, I think our outreach might be a little bit different, um, and there's an increasingly um, you know powerful tools through LinkedIn which we can use to tap into the right resources, taking advantage of some of that great resignation stuff which you've spoken about. Um, so I, I think maybe some of our outreach might be different, but I don't think fundamentally the way um, the way we recruit or the may, way we make decisions is fundamentally going to change based on data. Um, yeah. You can maybe use some data inputs for, to help you find candidates, but I, I think making decisions on candidates, especially with the big cultural focus that we have, isn't yeah. he's going to be too influenced by data, I, I wouldn't have thought. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, one of the things that, that we did change, um, I think this was pre, pre-COVID pre even, was we made the decision to start recruiting more nationally. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, that that definitely isn't isn't going to isn't going to stop. And that's definitely to, to ultimately just try to open up um open up the doors to 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 more potential candidates really um who 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 are really interested in helping us drive that data strategy forward so um but yeah i don't really see massive changes to be honest yeah okay and um you you mentioned i was going to try and avoid the pandemic word um but we've said it now so (laughs) no it's fine we'll we'll, we'll, we'll go with it but but obviously we're in our beautiful office so we're on the south coast so in between kind of southampton and uh, portsmouth beautiful beautiful building um in the uk we've got sites in in nottingham um in guernsey as well um have you seen since the the, the, that period of time won't use the word again um have you have you seen a sort of sort of shift in terms of kind of what life is like working at at spec savings you talked about but obviously we're more open in terms of working locations but yeah. in terms of like working patterns flexibility what's what's that like working in your team Helen? I mean I think I mean I think Specsavers has always been flexible um, but I think that um, I think actually ironically um, we, so our team is split across Guernsey and, and, and the UK um, but actually I think what the, the Guernsey team have started to say is that actually they feel more connected now um, with, with the rest of the data team than maybe they did before. And I think there's definitely advantages um, to, to us not all necessarily being in, in based in different offices. Um, but I think, um, you know, that we're, we're, we're a hugely flexible organisation. And um, I, I think for us, it's really about quality um, time as a team and and you know being being um you know when you need to have face to face conversations um you know having those face to face conversations but when you don't um you know that's also fine to be in a space where you work best and for some people that is in a is in a slightly busier office and it is a beautiful um place to be and the guernsey office is um you know really vibrant and and busy as well and lovely um and sometimes people prefer that and sometimes people prefer to get their head down and and be at home and and i think we're really flexible at at um allowing people to do what's best for them really 
Yeah, I think one of the things I really liked um, as, we, as we sort of came out of um, that sort of lockdown period was that principle of, of, of heads down, heads up and heads together of, of, of that there is some time where you just want to get your head down and just concentrate on some stuff. There's some times where heads up and you sort of getting that buzz in the office and probably again for your team connecting and overhearing conversations around well, we want to do this with customer All right what's that and jumping into it and, and getting those links but also that time to come together and that uh, and nothing really yeah. beats that of just being able to kind of thrash something out together yeah. so that so that, that blend is, is is really important and I yeah. think to your point we probably were doing that before but it's it's it feels like we've got the tools now to really do that really really well actually in the organization now, yeah maybe. Yeah, I think and it's, it's it's getting the mix, isn't it? You kind of need all three elements, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The one thing that does change is like, look, where's your centre of gravity almost? Like, where's where's the default location? As you said, we've got an incredible location here, but as as we're recruiting more nationally and some of the candidates I'm talking to now, like where they are isn't even at the forefront of my my thinking. Like, their, their distance from this office isn't isn't remotely. Um, like even at the forefront of my thinking because we are recruiting that nationally but the one thing that does change is if we do need to get all the team together and this is the conversation we're now beginning to have like like where does that happen do we want to drag some people all the way down here of course it's a great office you feel the cultural vibe here yeah, we yeah. want people here but we don't want to do that every time we want to bring the team together so how do how do we make that work that's a that's an interesting kind of like wrinkle of of modern day uh, remote working as well yeah, no, absolutely. Um, uh, another question which I, I really like, which was, um, uh, uh, what advice would you give to someone early um, who's starting their um, sort of an early career in, in in data? So aside from coming and working for us, have you got any other kind of top tips that you would um, that you'd kind of put out there? Um, I'd say, yeah, unless you deeply feel passionate about a data discipline, don't get too caught up on on, on what where is my discipline, right? Yeah. The, the one thing which we tried to do um, with our grad scheme last year that we had a lot of success out of, and, and when we bring future data grads into the organization, is immerse them in those different data disciplines. So that they get they get that varied approach and they get to understand like where do they want to be. So of course, if if of course you're extremely passionate about engineering and you know you want to be an engineer, yeah, get after it, go do it. But don't be too narrowed in that. Like I, I, I need to be kind of like a pigeonhole into into an area because you might not know until you spend a bit of time across them. Um, so yeah, that, that that'd be my biggest bit of advice. I think that's really good. I think that's really good advice. I think um, I think probably the thing for me would be um, focus on focus on the outcomes um, that you want to achieve within your role. Like whether that's whether you whatever discipline you go into, I think sometimes as data professionals we can lose sight of actually what we're ultimately trying to achieve, and it might become you know we want to do something that's you know in the coolest tool or uh, the coolest technique if you're a data scientist, yeah. but actually sometimes the simplest things drive the bigger the bigger benefits, yeah, and I yeah. think. Um, you know, uh, companies want to drive the biggest benefits. So, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I think my advice would be uh, focus on focus on outcome. And, and do you feel do, do you feel kind of a constant pressure to almost prove a return of investment of 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 the products that you've created, or the suite mm -hmm. of things that you do, or do you feel like issuing it is enough? You don't need to kind of almost do the justification of, and this is what it will kind of I'm, tell you. I mean, I'm a big believer in um, we don't finish our roles as data professionals until whatever product we've delivered is embedded and driving benefit, even yeah. though a lot of the time that embedding part doesn't actually sit with us mm -hmm. as a team. It sits with people in the wider organisation often. Um, but it's something that's, I think, been hammered home to me. So so much throughout my career um I'm really passionate about it I think you know otherwise you know an, an ROI can be doesn't necessarily need to be monetary no, no, you know it yeah. could be it could be saving sites it could yeah. be um it could be saving hearing it, it, could, it could be improving uh you know supply chain efficiency um stats or productivity but um which might also have a commercial outcome as well but I think that um it, it definitely needs to tick that tick that box, um, and I think that if you if you're not ticking that box, then ultimately, what's the point of the product in the first place? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, and with that in mind, do you have quite a structured approach to to building requirements before you kind of like you say kind of run rush off and start saying right, what's the tool we're going to use and how we're going to do it? What's that process like to kind of really structure your thinking? I mean, we're always trying to focus on outcomes, but we're also very conscious of delivering iteratively. Yeah. So it's it's a balance, isn't it, between the two? We want a really clear outcome, but we also want to then chunk it up to what's the smallest amount, ultimately, the smallest amount of 
value or the biggest amount of value for the least amount of effort yeah. but uh, and 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 not not necessarily have a huge list of requirements um because i think otherwise we we you know i think it well, it's, it can be a bit too motivating for the team as well if the projects are absolutely massive so we we try and chunk it into small um, small chunks and deliver iteratively and, and constantly look for opportunities to improve um, and I think that has multiple benefits actually in terms of um, delivering for your stakeholders but also engagement in the team it's you know it's nice to feel like you're yeah, actually adding yeah, value absolutely. iteratively. Yeah no definitely definitely and uh, and some of the successes that you've seen you mentioned clinical kind of work that's that's been something that's quite a kind of dial shift is it is, is there's been some other kind of successes you think actually looking right reflecting back now there's like these kind of kind of key points where you think actually that was that was a game changer that's really kind of yeah. moved that part of the business on yeah I mean so clinical definitely I think we've had some really great successes there and I mean some of the reports have have absolutely saved sight and I think um, it's really great to see that and I think the thing that I love about the clinical side is that um, it's it's the information that they've now the clinicians have got their hands on which is actually doing that it's the clinicians in the stores that are really driving that not data professionals which I think is really great and totally where we want to get to in terms of that sort of devolution um, but yeah undoubtedly probably the next biggest area is marketing yeah. um, without a doubt that we've we've really made a difference and it's been really great actually because there was a big um, program to to Im improve um, our CRM capability and um, and that was absolutely uh, firmly underpinned by data sort of end to end really across so many of our pillars and we've got a really great relationship with um with with the marketing team and it's been really really great to work sort of hand in hand on that program of work and there's so many different elements actually but it but um you know right the way from improving some data quality all the way up to pred predictive modeling um but actually summing up the benefits it's it, it's it's really substantial actually when you take a step back and you think wow i mean it's always surprising i think isn't it whatever team you're in when you take a step back and look at all the things you've delivered yeah, in the year absolutely. it's like wow you know i do feel really proud of the team and what they delivered over the years um, there was a question just in terms of um, we talked a little bit about kind of recruitment of key roles in within your teams, um, but also um, so, so, so someone's just asked in terms of data uh, sort of skills that we're bringing into non data roles. Uh, do we do that through our recruitment process? Are we acknowledging data within um, other roles that we recruit for? It's a great question. Mm. Um, I'd love to say yes, we are, <laughs> um, and there is a focus on having data as a discipline across every role. But I'm not sure it's quite there in our talent search um, at this time, right? There's a lot of um, there's a lot of programs um, in, in in the vein of uh, or in the guise of uh, data literacy, and then also just in general, right across our learning and development program, we've got very good tie-in at a leadership level uh, uh, at all levels of the organisation to build data into all of our roles. I'm, I'm not quite sure we've got it yet in our, in our, in our recruitment process. Okay. I'd say it's definitely where we want to be. Yeah. It's, a great, it's yeah. a great idea. Who asked? Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know. We'll weave that one in. We'll weave that one in. If anyone great from ideas. Recruitment's listening, yeah, absolutely. A um, couple of um, other good kind of questions. So, um, Kat Gregory's just asked us, with the culture and desire to develop um, um, our own sort of talent within the organisation, are there plans to work with our learning development team um, to build and deliver knowledge and learning through island platforms in relation to, um, to sort of data skills? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, we're already working quite significantly, actually, with the L&D team to to make sure that we're really um, aligned. Um, we've we've actually already worked um, really closely with them on the, on um, the the internal leadership program, um, and we've and we've been working actually a lot with external partners as well. So we, we're we're sort of doing an assessment really of how we tackle end to end training and upskilling across the organisation and. Um, but yeah, it's 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 been a big focus for us over the past year. It's going to become an even bigger focus actually over the next couple of years because it's such a massive task, isn't it, um, yeah. to undertake? But um, yeah, de it definitely has to be hand in hand with um, with the L and D team. And it's always moving as well, isn't it? So yeah. so so whatever programs or strategies you put in place for learning, actually the the, the, the world moves on really quickly. I know just from a customer perspective, um, a customer of, of your teams, there's there's a great level of support as well. It's kind of there. I think. The, the, the transformation I've seen in terms of the team members and the skill set that they've been able to develop both technically and 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 culturally actually in terms of using data I think has been really really positive so I think there's some great great offerings that's there for in terms of the, the team so yeah that, that out there as well. Um, 
someone just asked, um, how much value do you find third party um, brings to business decisions? So are we using sort of third parties to help us kind of get to those kind of um, that decision making that we need to do in terms of data? Third party data or? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, I would say. I, so. I think um, I, I, we, sometimes I would say, but I would say the majority of our focus today is is in is is our internal data sources. Yeah. Um, and, and that's quite simply, actually, to be honest, because when, when I first joined, it was something that we, we we didn't have all our data together and we weren't really able to join the dots between so many of our existing data. Our focus was let's focus, you know, on our own data initially and then look to expand. Obviously, there are teams already that are are, are using external sources, but, um, but the, our focus definitely is still on um, our, our mainly our internal data and um, but that will that will absolutely grow and expand as we as we sort of progress through our transformation really. Thank you very much. I, I'm just gonna, there's a lovely comment that I'm just going to end on um, which I think is really really um, a nice place to, 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 to kind of wrap up um, which was a shout out from data leaders to say that they're really excited to partnering um, us and to help um, all of the data teams connect with data professionals around the world and I just think that that networking community both internally and externally is just so important to our kind of future successes and I don't know if there's anything you want to kind of end on with that yeah. um, to, to kind of finish this off. Helen. Yeah I mean it, it is so true isn't it and I think um, I mean, data, I think, has a really great community, actually, and it's it's, rel it's fairly, um, you know, close knit, I think, in, in some senses. But yes, yeah, so important, I think, um, you know, communities, communities, are, I, I feel quite passionate about communities generally, actually, um, you know, externally and internally. But yes, it's such an important part of our strategy. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And, and thank you both for your time. Um, but more importantly, thank you for everyone for um, dialing in and being part of um, this session. There were some fantastic um, questions and it was great to get a sense of people from so far afield, which was um, which was really lovely um, as well. Thank you. So um, in terms of um, next steps, please, please do follow us along on um, LinkedIn because we're going to be um, hopefully attending more of these events as we move forward um, on different areas of the organisation. Um, and do let us know if there's a different part of the organisation you'd like to hear more about, then um, we would absolutely love to kind of focus in and do a bit of a deeper dive as, as well. Um, but thank you so much for your time um, and hopefully you enjoy the rest of your evening.